at cspan.org. This week on Lectures in History, Towson University history professor Elizabeth Gray talks about the use and public opinions on opium and laudanum in the 19th century. Professor Gray describes how most laudanum addicts at the time were upper-class women who originally had been prescribed the drug by their doctors. She argues that since men at the time were less likely to seek medical attention and it was more socially acceptable for them to drink, this created a gender divide between alcoholics and opium addicts. Her class is about 45 minutes. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Today we are looking at the issue of drug addiction in 19th century America, or the term that they would have used at the time, habitual drug use, because this is before the concept of addiction had really been clearly understood. Um, And uh, so we're going to look at sort of how that idea really develops and begins to develop what was called a social meaning. Even though we're going to be looking at addiction in America, I've mentioned that uh, one of the things we're really going to be focusing on at the beginning is not America, but on England, and specifically a man named Thomas De Quincey. So for today, you've read an excerpt of De Quincey. You've read a little bit about him. Who can start us off and just tell us who was Thomas De Quincey? CJ. He was an upper-class, early 19th century Victorian British gentleman considered himself a classical philosopher, um, and he came to use opium in the form of laudanum for uh, the relief, essentially, of a toothache in about 1804, and eventually developed it into a recreational enhancement use. He enjoyed the opera, he enjoyed the dream states and the trance it brought on, and uh, it eventually developed or degenerated into chronic abuse uh, at its height, about 12,000 drops of laudanum a day, mm-hmm. um, which is a staggering amount for me to think about. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. So um, um, so we have him beginning this for, for medical use, and then it, it continues from there. And I was wondering if you all could tell me, from the excerpt you've read about him, what did you think of him? I mean, did you get any specific impression of what De Quincey was like? Did he seem... Likeable, or what did you think of him, Shelby? He definitely represented like the Victorian ideals. Like he seemed like very arrogant, kind of condescending, like talking about like they went to the theater, how like oh the Turks wouldn't like understand it, they wouldn't like it. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. So there is this snobbery, this this very you know strong pride that he had in his in his intellect. Sam, I seem pretty well educated with that said though. Okay, right. So he pretty well educated. His knowledge of Greek, for example, yes. Okay. Any other comments about about De Quincey's? personality. Uh, Robbie? Yeah, I was going to kind of go off that. He was, like, well-respected by, like, his uh, people, like, people, like, above him, like, his educators, even right. at a young age. Right, so he, ha- he has these teachers who are amazed at, like, how fluent in Greek he is, for example. Right, okay. So we have these aspects of, um, of De Quincey's personality, and a couple of things with regard... To, okay, so De Quincey, we've discussed who he was. He was this Englishman um, and well-educated and, uh, and ends up unwittingly addicted to laudanum after first taking it to relieve himself of a, he had a toothache. He had facial pains. Can anyone tell us what he didn't understand about the addiction that he was experiencing? Can anyone tell us what it was that he didn't... that he got wrong? Evan... The article states that he had, and this was common for people back in those days, there was no concept of addiction, period. Okay. And um, he just, he called it just uh, an uh, an opiate or, um, the, what, what was the name? Laudanum. Laudanum. Laudanum habit. Mm-hmm. So, okay. he just... Okay, right. So part of what we're discuss- we're getting at is how this sort of idea of a habit evolves and how people begin to understand it. And... Um, what was it that he didn't understand about what was going on with him with this usage? Yeah, Dustin. What I understood from what the author was talking about was um, the difference between alcohol withdrawals and, and opium withdrawals. Okay. What he would describe as his withdrawals wasn't didn't last as long as what the metal the medical community would say. Okay, right, exactly. Can anyone tell us why it was if opium withdrawal is a process of about, they say it's like having a case of the flu for a week. Why did he, what, why did he say that he, this was going on for four months? Sarah? Um, in part, it could have been because he was sort of eccentric and exaggerating, but also because um, there's, laudanum is made up of 
highly concentrated alcohol, essentially. So he was most likely also experiencing withdrawal from the alcohol. Okay, exactly. So what we have is opium itself, and I have a picture of an opium poppy here. Opium itself is this sort of, um, I mean, it, raw opium is this sort of brown gummy stuff that comes out of a, an opium poppy. And it's the raw material. What he was using was laudanum. And laudanum, there are different recipes for it, but it would be opium with alcohol, sometimes with spices. It could be wine, it could be brandy, there were different things. But what he was doing was, was giving up laudanum, and so this is a different substance. And, um, and as, as Sarah noted, with his dependency, part of it could be that he wasn't recognizing that trying to give up both was going to have this impact, but part of it is also the fact he could have been exaggerating it because he wanted this work to sell, he wanted it to be a better story. Now, as has already been noted, the reason that he began taking it was as a medicine, and he emphasizes that that was his original reason. And then he ends up experiencing more than he had anticipated, and he divides his work into two parts the first one is called The Pleasures of Opium. Can anyone describe anything he describes as a pleasure, something that he got out of this? Alex? Yeah, well, he would say that he would go to the opera house to watch uh, a woman perform, mm -hmm. and that he would take opium before he went there to get a better experience. He said, um, he said something along the lines of, uh, you can buy happiness for a penny, and that you can just carry happiness in your coat pocket wherever you want it. Okay, exactly. That, that you know, this is beyond what anything he had anticipated about the experience. Robbie. Okay. Okay. Opium. Okay. He felt like it kind of enhanced his, um, I guess, like his mental or whatever protects the dreams. Right, that he's able, that he has these amazing dreams that he's sort of able to reach in and find things that he had, he had forgotten. He compares it to like a religious ecstasy mm -hmm. and his classicist roots come through when he contraposes it with wine where it's like disorder versus bringing order and clarity, right? He sees the Apollo versus Dionysus uh, dynamic working. Okay, yeah, he very much has this distinction of opium being sort of the opposite in terms of creating more focus rather than less. So we have the pleasures of opium, then we have the pains of opium. Who can tell us what were some of the things that he experienced that were that were bad, Shelby? Like, well, the dreams became really horrible. Like there were like like physical like and, like horror, and how he kept dreaming like an alligator was like in his dreams, and how even after he stopped taking the opium, he still experienced these like really like horrendous nightmares. Right, and so there's sort of no way to get away from them entirely. Exactly, Jeff. Well, he also said, like, he was, when he'd get a letter, he, like, it was impossible for him to, like, write a response or something like that. So it was probably, like, hard to focus and hard to think and actually, like, sit down and do stuff. Right. He has letters that just sit there. He doesn't reply to them. He has, he has uh, things he wants to say. He just can't do it. Pat? Um, it said it was, like, basically it shot his memory. So he couldn't remember anything past, like, his, you know, I guess past the next minute or something, you know, he couldn't remember past, I don't know. Okay. But it shot his memory pretty okay. much. Okay, yeah, it, it really does have this effect where he, he really can't be productive. Right, yeah. Did I? Um, it also stated that opium irritated his stomach and made him sweat severely. Okay. So his physical... Yes. What you put on the outside. Yes. So definitely, in addition to the to the mental um, uh, consequences that you've described, there are definitely negative physical consequences as well. Um, and one thing that the work gets criticized for is that they say a lot of people read about the pleasures of opium and stopped reading, and so they were curious about it and its potential, and they were not focused on the fact that it that it obviously had these negative consequences. I want to place or look at opium in the context of what we've done thus far this semester. Um, earlier this semester, we looked at chocolate and tobacco, which had been unknown in European culture before Columbus, before the modern era, and sort of how a society begins to understand these substances that really they had never heard of before. Then we have something like alcohol which had been a part of European culture, obviously, for centuries and centuries, and it might change when it, they're using more distilled spirits, but it was something they were really familiar with. <coughs> opium is sort of in neither of those categories. Opium had been used as a medicine for centuries and centuries. It was known as that. It had been used as laudanum. Can anyone tell us why someone would use opium? Can anyone tell us what opium, what, what, yeah, Evan? 
warfare, war, like soldiers' casualties, any kind of surgery as an analgesic. Exactly. So it's a painkiller. It works well as sort of a sleeping pill. And because of those reasons, it was prescribed a whole lot. It wasn't like there were just one or two ailments. It was generally used because it's a painkiller and also to help people sleep. Opium as a luxury was not something, and luxury is the term they keep using. It's what we would refer to today as recreational use, the idea of it not being used as a painkiller but to sort of elevate, to feel better than normal. And that's where opium transitions, and De Quincey is the one who really helps Americans to see that that is a part of what opium's potential is. Okay. Now, um, and so, let me see, okay. And so De Quincey's role, as I say, is that he's the one who really puts this in public discussion. And I'll describe, there were certainly cases of Americans who had been using the drug in this other manner for decades, but you don't have it publicly discussed. It's when De Quincey's work is published, and the first American edition is 1822, that Americans first really read about this and read about it from a Western perspective. The earliest ways in which Americans or Westerners were learning about these drugs being used as a luxury, being used in a recreational manner, would be from the accounts of travelers who would travel to parts of the world, parts of Asia, parts of what is now the Middle East. The explanation for opium use that was often given was that Muslims are forbidden by their religion from drinking alcohol, therefore opium was sort of their alcohol, is the way it's described. Now, there was a uh, Frenchman named Sir John Chardin, who traveled to Persia, which is now Iran. In the 17th century, here's his description of what, was going, of what he saw in Persia. I want you to read this, and then we will discuss it. Who can tell us what Chardin was describing, what it was that he saw when he was in Persia? Um, Alex. I mean, he was saying that, you know, um, opium, you know, made people happy, made people laugh and, you know, talk crazy and so on and so forth. But then after the experience is over, they become zombies pretty much. They just become dull and delescent. And what do they need to do in order to, to revive that uh, uh, Shelby? They need to take more opium in order to get that feeling back. Okay, right. So what he's describing is, in a, an abbreviated manner, what De Quincey would describe later, the pleasures of opium, the pains of opium, seeing you know that, that it has this effect that seems very positive and enjoyable, but then someone needs more and more or else he's going to be cold, pensive, and heavy. Okay, so we have this, and we have a lot of these accounts where people will, Westerner, Western men will travel to different parts of the world, and they'll describe what they see in terms of, um, in terms of drug use. And what they're describing in these accounts is, again, what we would today call recreational use or non-medical use, and is often at the time described as a luxury, that this is something they don't need, this is something that the people just enjoy. The reason that these accounts are so important is they are pretty much the only information that the Westerners have for a long time about, again, what we would call recreational drug use. And so they're the main source of information, even for doctors, where doctors, when they're trying to describe what can be done with opium, what its impact can have, part of what they are um, doing is they'll look at the writings of Sir John Chardin or others. And because these travelers are going in many different places, what ends up is this conclusion that every society uses something, that you can't go anywhere where the people aren't using some sort of substance again, as a luxury. And there was a um, man named David Cheever. 
In the 1860s, he was a professor on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. And he was doing this survey of all narcotics that were being used. And just to give you an idea, here's what he concluded about what was, about what was being used in the world. So you have these descriptions where, and, and there are many accounts like this, where they're, they're dividing up the world in different ways. And as you can see here, they're saying that the Persians are using hemp, not opium. But you have all of these descriptions of what's being used. Now, I didn't list absolutely everything. He also says that in the Pacific Islands, they use betel nut and that um, there's a Siberian fungus that's used in Siberia. He goes on and on. But what he ends up describing as this sort of universal aspect he says that there are three stages of this universal passion for sedatives or narcotics. And the three stages he describes, the first one, necessities, and that would be food, the idea that people need to eat. The second stage he sees would be to address uneasiness. And an example he gives is that Americans use alcohol, and I'm quoting, to assuage, uh, an American uses alcohol to assuage the cares of his mind and to banish uneasy reflections. The third stage, so that's getting rid of what's bad. The third stage is the pursuit of enjoyment. Not just to get rid of uneasiness, not just to you know get rid of whatever cares a person has, but that pursuit of enjoyment. This is an absolutely key point, and it's something we're going to see actually for the rest of the semester, um, that drug use gets accepted to an extent, and the difference is essentially whether it's the use is to address uneasiness or the pursuit of enjoyment. If this level is the level of someone who's feeling fine, if someone's feeling bad and they take a drug to feel normal, then that is seen as being acceptable. If they're feeling normal and they're taking the drug to feel better than normal, that's where there can be criticisms. I feel like we see that dynamic today with um, the trend in marijuana legislation in various states and the debate between medical usage and recreational usage and how there's in the mainstream a more um, acceptable sense that medical usage is permissible. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah, Sarah. I mean, it's accepted in hospitals as like a painkiller, yeah. but oh. obviously sold on the street. At right. No. Generally, exactly. Like, no. And so it really is a case where the context is everything um, with these. Uh, the context is everything with these. And what it links to at the end of the day is productivity. The idea is if someone's in pain, that person might not be getting much done. And if that person takes a drug and then is feeling fine, he can get stuff done. He can be productive. But if a person's already feeling good and fine and they take the drug and they might not be productive for the next few hours, you know, we have the quote about the Persians who for the next four or five hours, then you have this focus on the idea that that is making society less efficient because it's taking an, a productive person and making them unproductive. So productivity is sort of at the, um, at the core of this. Okay. Now, so we have the big picture, but what about what was going on in America? Okay. Now, Okay, addiction in early America. There are glimpses one has of drug use or potential drug use in America before De Quincey and, and habitual use. Um, one example, there was a French immigrant named J. Hector Saint-Jean de Crevecoeur. He immigrated to the U.S. from France as a teenager and in 1782, he wrote a work called Letters from an American Farmer. And one of the things he wrote about was that on Nantucket, this is, this is what he said, that many women there take a dose of opium every morning and would be at a loss how to live without this indulgence, and that he had heard this. There are also things that are in private sources, meaning letters that have been preserved, other sources that were not intended for a public audience. Um, for example, there was a father and son 
who wrote a series of letters back and forth to each other in the 1770s, the son's wife was a laudanum addict, or what we would call a law. She was a habitual user of laudanum. The father wrote to his son in 1779, and I quote, tell her, I beg her, never to touch laudanum, which I hear she still takes. It is as bad as dram drinking, and a dram would be a small serving of liquor. So you have these signs that this is happening, and of course there's every reason to believe that there were many other things that just never got captured in writing. Um, Oftentimes, this type of dependency was defended on one of three grounds. One, we've already discussed, was medical need. The fact that this person was not taking it as a luxury, they were taking it to get rid of a terrible stomach ache. They're taking it because they're dealing with some sort of pains or insomnia, and they, they want to feel better. Another, scientific experimentation. Um, some of the Western travelers who would go to other parts of the world would try the drug themselves because they figured that was the best way for them to report on what the effects actually were. And also some of them would say the drug was not dangerous. They would dismiss the notion that this was a concern. And you do have, again, some who are saying, well, this is just, you know, just as they would say that this is the thing, the alternative to alcohol, they would, they would play down any, any concerns. So we have these glimpses, but again, it wasn't publicly discussed until we get to De Quincey. And the reactions to De Quincey's work in America, um, many people thought it was interesting. And there was one reviewer, though, who said that he really was not worried. He said that he believed um, that there were few persons, if any, in this country the United States, who abandoned themselves to the use of opium as a luxury. This was written in 1824, and he did not think that this species of intemperance would take hold in the future. So he was not worried. And it is true that there weren't that many opium users at that time. Opium was imported. And so we have figures about how much was brought into the country. Now, some could be smuggled, but we have a pretty good estimate of how much was brought in. And the idea was... Um, David Courtright, a historian, did this calculation of how much was brought in and how much an addict would need, and he calculates that there were fewer than 11,000 addicts at the time. Now, the population of the United States at this point, and this is uh, in the early 1840s, he, he estimated it. Now, at this point in time, the population of the United States was about 7.8 million, but it would be less than one-tenth of a percent who would have been who would have been um, addicted. But the key is that it's after De Quincey's work that opium as a luxury really begins to sort of adopt a social meaning. And the question that people were trying to ask is, opium versus alcohol, which was better? Can anyone tell us, and it's been alluded to a little bit, why would some people say that, opi that if someone's going to be using opium or alcohol, it's better if they're using opium? Can anyone tell us why some would have said it's better for someone to be using opium rather than alcohol? Robbie. They did have medical use back then. Okay. I mean, it was known as a medical use for like oh. pain, so. Okay, right. So it has, these, it has these medical uses. Yeah, Dustin. It was cheaper. Okay, okay. It was cheaper. And even though it was cheaper, was it considered? More of a higher class of a, of a drug? Actually, we will see that it was, that the use was primarily among the upper class, and I'll explain, I'll explain why. Shelby? It's easier to stop using opium than alcohol. Actually, that's one thing that becomes contested about which is easier, which is easier to quit, um, and, and it's an important point. It's an important point. With opium, and also, what does De Quincey say? Can anyone recall what De Quincey said about what happens, Evan? It specifically mentioned in the reading that um, opium is easier to quit and that alcohol can actually cause D DTs and even death. Okay, no, the, the initial, the period of, with a period of detoxification or withdrawal is definitely, is definitely more dangerous with, with regard to alcohol. Alex. And in, in the reading, uh, to my understanding of what uh, De Quincey was saying, um, it seemed as if he thought that he had kicked his opium habit a couple times, and then because of his drinking, it led him back 
to opium. Okay, and he makes right. He makes four attempts to quit, and he is never he's never entirely successful. Um, what he says is makes it better is that opium allows a person to touch the divine, whereas alcohol brings out the more human and brutish qualities of a person. Okay, yeah. So you have to, a couple things going on here with regard to opium. Um, the suggestion is that opium has a positive impact on behavior. I mean, you know, that if someone's drunk, the person could be um, combative, the person could be loud. There was one uh, a guy in 1830 in Kentucky who wrote that the results of laudanum were not so immediately disgusting as that of alcohol use. So part of it is that idea. And De Quincey is saying, oh, how it provides this focus whereas alcohol makes someone less focused. You have others who are saying that alcohol was better, and there are a couple of reasons for this. One is the relationship of someone who drinks to society. This is something we've looked at a bit, the fact that you have people who, you know, with regard to drinking, people tend to drink with their friends, they'll buy a round of drinks, they'll toast each other, and so you have this idea that alcohol is something that people enjoy communally. Is opium something that people enjoy communally? Okay, CJ. Quincy talks about how just being in a crowd is oppressive and stifling and how you seek out quiet and solitude and, you know, calm, dark places. Okay, yeah, that this is, a, and, and that the most interesting thing to De Quincey is not other people, it's what's going on in his own mind. And therefore, it was seen as a, um, a, a substance that someone who's not a good citizen would prefer because they are more interested in themselves than anyone else. Now, um, Shelby and Evan are absolutely right when they note that the withdrawal from alcohol is worse than the withdrawal from opium, but what happens is this conclusion among many that many come to believe that if one is trying to give it up, not just give up the uh, in the detoxification process, but give it up altogether, they many come to believe that alcohol is the easier one to to give up altogether. And so what we have again is the beginning of the drug developing a social meaning where people sort of have this opinion of it rather than it being this this brand new thing. Okay, now, who were the early American addicts? With regard to opiate usage in America, the demographic most likely to be addicted would be well-to-do women. There were a couple of reasons as to why this was the case. Can anyone recall why someone would begin, what the most common way was that someone would begin using a drug? First time they're using it. Yeah. For opium, um, things like toothaches and headaches, uh, medical need, okay. needs. Using it for medical need. And the idea was that from a financial standpoint, Not everybody could afford to go to a doctor. And the most common way to become addicted early on was that someone is in pain, they seek out a doctor, and a doctor recommends that they take it, and then the idea is that three years later, they're still using it. There were also a couple of reasons connected to gender. One of these reasons was the idea that there was this belief in the well, in early America, late 18th, early 19th century, that a man should not seek medical help. That if a man is ill, he should just deal with it. He should just be stoic, endure it, and um, he, shouldn't, he should not seek out a doctor. With women, that was not in place at all. The idea was that women were less able to withstand pain than men, and therefore the people who would have been most likely to go to doctors would have been well-to-do women. There's another reason. The attitude toward women drinking at the time was that this was very inappropriate, that a woman should not drink. And I have here the image from a temperance pamphlet where we have you know, some people who are walking upright and they look fine, and then we have these people who are sort of stumbling out of a place where they've been drinking. Can anyone tell us why a woman 
who, you know, lives in a society where it's considered inappropriate for her to drink any alcohol, why would laudanum be something that she could look to as an alternative? Can anyone tell us why that would be okay if, yeah, Robbie. I'm looking for her to stay in the house anyway. So, I mean, um, and, op and like you said earlier, uh, with opium, they want it to be more self-contained and away from everyone. Okay, okay, so you have, you have the focus on being self-contained, and you also have the fact that if, if someone is using laudanum and they're asked, why are you using laudanum, what could they say? And it would be a completely plausible explanation as to why they're using it. Uh, yeah, Sarah. The doctor prescri or prescribed it. Exactly, that it's for medical use, that this is, that this is something they're using for medical need. Um, and so you have women being disproportionately inclined to be, to be using it. So you begin to see with society's values, so social ideas, social constructions, this focus on who was using it. Now, part of what De Quincey's work does is to shock people with the fact that he became dependent. This is something that we have already discussed in this class. The notion, and this is something that Christine Sismondo refers to, the idea that the elites know how to drink, for example, that they know how to drink in a manner that's responsible, that other people don't, and that therefore they can, they are allowed to drink more, they can stay in a tavern longer because they just know how to do this the right way or the responsible way and other people don't. So you have this notion persisting, this, this, popular, um, this popular idea, but then you have people being quite surprised with regard to Thomas de Quincey. And the idea was that he is educated, he's Western, he is obviously very intelligent, and many assumed that someone like Thomas de Quincey would be able, he would have the strength or the willpower or whatever you want to call it, that he could avoid becoming addicted. And so there is a degree of sort of a wake-up call with the fact that he was not able to prevent this. Um, there was one person who wrote about confessions and said, and I quote, that it showed that um, de Quincey's strong intellect was scarcely proof against its tenacious clutch. So the fact that he can't do it shows, from many people's perspective, that anyone could be susceptible. This doesn't mean that the idea emerges that everybody is equally at risk, if you will, or that the impact is going to be the same on all. Now, there was a quote that one of you mentioned or alluded to when we were discussing De Quincey at the beginning, and I'm going to show this quote on the screen, and then we'll discuss what exactly he, uh, he means. Who can just summarize for us what De Quincey is saying in this passage? Who can just tell us what he's suggesting about what makes a difference in terms of impact? CJ. He um, is following, just before this, he was talking about going to the opera and enjoying that kind of stuff. And so he's talking about how opium enhances his ability to uh, enjoy refined pleasures and refined pursuits. He self-identifies as an intellectual, as a philosopher. And so uh, the Turk barbarians, right, the new Persian Empire and his kind of classical Greek worldview are incapable of achieving, you know, the enlightened uh, values of the West. Okay, right. He's suggesting that there is this difference um, and and what he's saying, he, he goes on to say that enjoying music is sort of an intellectual thing and that therefore he's going to enjoy it in a way that others that others would not. He is not the only one who suggests that different populations will experience the same substance in different ways because they are members of different races or different ethnic groups. I'd like you now to take a look at a quote from Nathan Allen, um, he was a physician who wrote a work called The Opium Trade, and widely, widely um, quoted work, very popular work, and I'd like you to read this and then we will discuss. Now, 
He uses some terms in there that might not be as familiar, but can anyone sort of summarize what it is that he is suggesting? Robbie, what's he suggesting? Um, he's, well, first, he's comparing um, uh, Indians and, and blacks to, to more of an animal nature, and um, he's saying basically when they take opium, it has a, a different effect on them, more of a physical effect. But uh, instead, with, um, with whites, they have a more developed mental structure. Um, thus, when they take opium, opium it uh, operates with the brain, and they have effects with the brain. Uh, um, from what I can see from that, basically, it's essentially more, more effective okay. uh, for them and beneficial rather than... Right. Black. Right. He's suggesting that there's this, that there's this benefit that, that um, results, and he, might I add that what you're seeing is what there is. He doesn't give any examples. He never, ever refers to either group again in this work. He just sort of throws this in there, and this part gets reprinted and reprinted in many different sources, this suggestion that there were these, um, the suggestion that this is, uh, uh, the suggestion that, that different races would experience different drugs, or experience the same drug in different ways. There are a few reasons as to why this was the belief. Um, one is, he was writing this, as I say, in 1853. The 1850s were a high point, and it goes, I mean, it's in the 18th century, it's in the 19th century. It is a high point for what is referred to as race science. And this is a time uh, also referred to as scientific racism, when you have scientists who are essentially trying to prove that races can and should be divided by looking at genetics, by looking at biology. Um, part of what they do is they look at skulls to try to differentiate. And part of what they're trying to do is to use science to prove that there was a racial hierarchy, this, these significant distinctions between races with whites at the top. So part of it is that Nathan Allen is writing at a time when this is really um, very much at its peak, that you know, everyone writes in the, as part of the society, the era in which they're writing. One of the things that's really key, which they were not taking into account, is that these drugs were consumed in different ways. Um, for example, uh, in China, opium was smoked. And this was being used as a as sort of a recreational thing. And the form of opium that is smoked is very different from the form that is used as a medicine. The form that is smoked has no medical uses. And so the suggestion, you know, I, I think it could seem pretty clear that someone who is smoking opium is going to have a different experience from someone who's using a different form of opium that's mixed with alcohol that they're taking to deal with a stomach ache. And yet they don't see it as being that the substance is the issue. They see it as being the user. Alex. What did they find? Uh, did they find any uh, scientific research on whether which, which was worse, which was better, smoking it or taking it with some other form of... It remains way? contested. One of the things that was believed, for example, as a result of opium use, some people would, go, would travel to parts of the world and they insisted that... An, every opium addict is dead by 30, that it has this terribly debilitating impact, that they are emaciated, they can't get anything done, and that they're going to die by 30. There's a case in 1831, I think, a Scottish nobleman died. He had been an opium addict, and he hadn't told his life insurance company. They don't want to pay out the policy because they say, well, he never told us this. And the evidence they, that doctors come in and say, no, they know of people who've been addicted for decades. So it remains contested. It goes to the courts. Um, and it's an excellent question because it, it does remain contested. I think you can overdose. I mean, in terms of, like, just quick effects. Oh. I think it's easier to overdose if you're taking it, though, as opposed to smoking it. Yeah. Like, no, no, definitely it, has, definitely it has dangers. But in terms of habitual use, it remains contested. But no, definitely it, it can, yeah, definitely its use can be fatal. So you have... Um, so you have these uh, discussions, and again, the drug is consumed in these vastly different ways, which isn't always taken into account. So you have the prejudice, you have that, but what is key is that what emerges from this is that many people come away with the belief that a drug will affect members of different groups differently, even if it's the same thing. This is what many people tend to, tend to conclude
and that this is used to sort of, you know, again, have this different attitude that if, if one person is using it, it might be fine, and if someone else is using it, that it might not be. Okay. Now. Yeah, Alisa. Was that just race, or was there, like, a notion of, like, women and men could handle it differently um, as well? <clears throat> It's a good question. With women and men, the perception would be different as well with regard to what obligations they aren't meeting. Um, it's also, and it also is changes over time because as De Quincey mentions, people sort of don't understand why he can't just quit because it's so new that people just don't think of it as, as such a problem. So it is, it is to an extent along lines of gender. It's also along lines of race. It's also along lines of class. Okay. Now, so we have these, these varying these varying perceptions. Um, the concern with addiction increases. The concern with addiction increases, and partly this is because there is a huge increase in usage between 1840 and 1870. And the reason we know this is because it was being imported. So we have the importation figures. And what they showed was that the drug was being imported at a vastly increasing rate that was much growing much more than the population was. So this wasn't just the case that there were more Americans and therefore there was a larger, uh, uh, there was a larger body of users. Yes? The Miller article talked about how it was 1850 that the hypodermic needle is developed and so morphine starts coming into use. Is that part of this uh, morphine, explosion? Yes. Now, morphine, um, you do have the beginnings of that. It's really actually right after the Civil War that it becomes highly used. And actually, one of the things, and it's it's fortunate because the when morphine, and morphine is the active property in opium. It's the alkaloid, and it allowed to give, it permitted pharmacists and doctors to give much more specific doses. And Doctors loved giving morphine injections to patients who were in pain because it was very quick, so it made the patient pain-free, which made the family happy. The problem is it's later discovered that that is the form of administering the drug that is the most likely to result in addiction. And so you have a huge number of morphine addicts in the late 19th century. So it, you have the glimmers of it, but it really, it really hits a, a, few, a few years later. So you have this increase in usage. And this recognition that a lot of people must be using this, again, in what we would call a recreational manner or as a luxury, because it certainly is not something that is just being used, um, is being used just for, for uh, medical purposes. What they're concerned with is nothing less than the fate of the nation. And there's a reason for this which connects to Chinese opium smoking. Um, Great Britain in the early 19th century was importing a lot of opium into China and it was being, uh, it was used there again, opium smoking. Um, it was being used as they would have called it a luxury. And so when you have this extensive usage, uh, the Westerners, Americans would observe what was happening in China. And might I add, in 1839, the Chinese tried to stop the importation, and you have the first of a series of what are called opium wars between, between, um, in this case, Great Britain and uh, and China. The perspective that many Americans had was the idea that China was this ancient culture that had so many accomplishments, and what they perceive is that opium has sort of single-handedly stopped the progress of China, and so the concern becomes. What is going to happen if that happens here? Um, what if this use of it as a luxury becomes more widespread? And if it does become more widespread, then is that going, what damage is that going to do to, uh, to the United States? And part of the concern was what were called modern times. And modern times is what they tended to think of as the second half of the 19th century you have industrialization. You have the notion that there's increased competition. You have the notion of things moving at a faster pace. Transportation literally was moving at a faster pace. And the idea that society was speeding up. 
And as a consequence, and I'm going back to Dr. David Cheever, who was on the staff of Harvard Medical School in the 1860s. He was the one who was describing what drugs were used in different parts of the world. What he said was that some people might think it was bizarre that he's talking about um, that he's talking about um, such drugs as opium and hemp because the idea was that those weren't being used here, so why bother? He wrote, and I'm quoting, the Caucasian races are no longer content with tobacco, coffee, and tea, and that what they would be seeking would be stronger narcotics, and that this was directly connected to the fact that society was moving so quickly that people would need something to address their cares, their uneasiness, the exhaustion that they were feeling. And again, there is this racial aspect because the focus was on professionals. As they describe it at the time, they use the phrase brain work a lot, that people who were brain workers were the ones who really needed this kind of, um, this kind of uh, assistance, that they were the ones who needed to relax. And a lot of this really comes to a head, as we'll be seeing, in the 1870s when um, domestic drug use becomes a major topic of, uh, of discussion in America as opposed to being De Quincey, the focus on De Quincey. So, in conclusion, what we have is that Thomas De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, although it was not an American publication, played an important role in shaping Americans' views. First of all, it makes the issue a topic of public debate. It also demonstrates that Westerners were susceptible to habitual use, and it also was one where he's saying, suggesting that some groups can enjoy the drug in better ways than others can. And as we will see, this tendency to see everybody as susceptible to use, but not to see all use of the same drug the same way, is something that is going to be persisting, shaping views and also shaping policy. Are there any questions? Yeah. Is there any um, evidence of slaves being prescribed opium? There are not. Um, there are a couple of cases where where a doctor would prescribe it. Yes. Yes. So there are there are a few cases. CJ. The uh, Miller article talked about his impact on popular culture and popular perceptions. I was just wondering if there's any. Um, knowledge that he impacted H.P. Lovecraft, because some of the gothic horror that Miller talked about, De Quincey writing towards the end, sounded very Lovecraftian. I'm not specifically sure. It's a good question, and it's, it's definitely likely that, that, that there could be that influence, because the writing was incredibly, um, incredibly influential. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you all. Have a good weekend, and I will see you on Monday.